All right, everyone, it's time to talk about China because uh, Trump, in the uh, lead up to his visit with Jinping there, uh, the leader of uh, the Chinese commies, uh, has decided to hardball the Chinese uh, and not to actually uh, uh, sort of formulate a working strategy, if you believe the corporate media, but I think I see what he's doing here. This is part of Trump's negotiating style. He's giving a real curveball to the Chinese before he meets with them, get them all riled up, make it seem like he's unbalanced, kind of a little out there and unwilling to work in a diplomatic sense on the North Korea issue. Of course, what he said is, well, you know, we're not going to wait for China. We'll take care of it ourselves if we have no choice. But therein lies the caveat. It's the if we have no choice part, which brings the Chinese to the table makes it seem to them uh, more of a concerning pressing issue. This is obviously, judging from the amount Trump has fixated on the DPRK, and this is one part bad to two parts good in my estimation what he's doing on the issue, which is to say it's, it's decent. And you can make a, a for or against sort of a debate on the point, but at the same time, it, it is a pressing issue. Uh, they are eventually going to get hydrogen weapons uh, and so forth you know if we do nothing if there's no further action that's taken eventually they progress to that stage they do get miniaturization and i think that's something even the chinese don't want but trump considers it obviously to be enough of a pressing issue to try to uh, in a diplomatic sense hardball the chinese force them to take notice of the situation number one while they usually uh, try to ignore it uh, except for the occasional round of sanctions Number two, impress upon them the, the concerns of the Western world uh, towards really uh, this issue. Now, what form a solution takes uh, really depends, honestly, on what the Chinese do. If the Chinese were to stonewall, do nothing about it, it is entirely possible that the United States will unilaterally move in, liberate North Korea. China would not be involved. Uh, we'd, there'd be a bloody death toll in North and South Korea, and then the Korean Peninsula would unify. China may no longer even be particularly concerned about that. Ch China's too busy building like colonialist factories in East Africa and parts of Central America. They may literally start ignoring that. They may say, yeah, but we're not really enemies with the West anymore. We're exporting all sorts of goods to them. Uh, maybe we can get Trump to withdraw some of his uh, trade war ideas in exchange for, yeah, let's reunite the Korean Peninsula in a fairly short struggle that would lead to, I think, lasting peace in that region. It's entirely possible that's his goal. What we may see from Trump is a strategy that's built around reunifying Korea as actually being one of the key proposals that he puts forth. And that's probably, of all the places in the world where we could be or have been involved, in a military sense, or whatever that sense happens to be, whether it's outright invasion, whether it's advising other military forces or just supplying them with logistics and maybe aid or something. Of all the places in the world I can think of, North Korea is probably the one place where we'd actually be seen as having liberated somebody and having done inarguably good for the world instead of evil. When we involve ourselves in a place like Syria, even if Trump's idea of involvement is we're going to help uh, uh, cripple ISIS, that's what we're focused on, we're leaving Assad alone, as opposed to Obama, oh, let's bomb Assad, let's prop up the FSA that bombs Assad, and let's raise hell in the region. Even if his ideas in places like Syria or Libya are different from Obama or different from the Clintons, it's still a level of involvement in an area where U.S. policy has already inflamed the situation. The problem is that people's perception in many of those regions is already uh, of the United States as the great Satan or agents of, you know, the netherworld or something like that. They look at us not as any sort of pro-freedom uh, sort of uh, liberating figures. They see us as the terrorists in many cases because of the no-fly zone getting rid of Gaddafi in Libya. Now their culture's flatlined. The civil war in Syria. And now their culture is flatlined. Our involvement in Iraq, it's a tenuous uh, sort of semi-stability in only some parts of Iraq. And that's about as good as it's ever been there in the last decade. You look to Afghanistan, uh, opium growth is everywhere. The Taliban is everywhere. Al-Qaeda still operates there, although they do so in semi-autonomy from like ISIS or some of the even worse groups you know, that, that you know, Obama largely ignored while fighting Assad 
through funding the FSA and giving them all sorts of like anti-tank weapons and stuff, which he wasn't even supposed to be doing. Trump's foreign policy so far is a little bit of the modified post, uh, post FSA involvement Obama with the drone strikes. I do not agree, by the way, with that part of Trump's foreign policy thus far. I see it as a mistake. And a little bit of the scale back aid government forces that are capable of bringing stability, uh, but otherwise largely not involve ourselves in any official capacity, that I support. When Trump sort of warmongers after Yemen, and of course the Yemeni rebels actually just stormed the Saudi border and raised hell on but it was sort of a scorched earth, uh, miniaturized not that many days ago. When he speaks of that, I, I tend to disagree with Trump. I don't think that that's a good idea. But with Korea, yeah, I think I could make an exception. You look at Kim Jong-un, the way he operates his country. North Korea is literally just a criminal syndicate, a cartel that happens to have a military capable of holding territory. That's really all it is. To the point at which even their communist ideals internally have been tempered just so the country doesn't flatline. Kim Jong-un and his upper military brass and some of his inner circle of advisors and family members, they live high on the hog, eat their caviar, smoke the cigars, drink the imported vodka while everybody else suffers. They ultimately, it's, it's like some people, some people who proclaim themselves to be nationalists in the Western sense, like European ethno-nationalists. They, they look at North Korea and say, oh yeah, but they're, it may be brutal, it may be fucked up, but it's also independent and they're nationalistic. No, they're not. They're really not. The, the isolation of the regime keeps them ethnically nationalistic by proxy, but it's, that's just a, a sideshow. That uh, has nothing to do with the actual reason for those policies. The actual reason is you grind down the population, absorb all of the wealth that you are making, and at least this small group of people lives very well, and then sort of the upper tiers of the military, they kind of have a good existence, along with some of the limited internal merchantile class, and then the, the other 90% of the population is miserable. They live in complete and abject poverty, and that's an uptick in their human development from like a decade ago, when it was even more abject and people were dying left and right of famine. If there's one place in the world where U.S. involvement could properly uh, performed, make a difference, and actually increase freedom in the world, yeah, it's probably North Korea. Iran? No, I'd, I'd, I'd leave Iran alone. I don't care about their centrifuges. They haven't even developed a test weapon. North Korea has already detonated five atomic weapons. One failed, the other four were apparently successful. They have managed to make them slightly larger over time. Eventually, they will get to the 100 kiloton weapon, some boosted stage. Now, it is possible for them to do that not long from now. And at some point, if we do nothing, if we don't work with China to get this solved or, or act unilaterally, as Trump suggests, is on the table, China will get involved. North Korea won't exist anymore, it'll become a Chinese vassal, it'll become little more than a puppet, and it'll become essentially kind of a province of China. In which case, there will never be Korean unification. Now, I understand a lot of the people in South Korea probably don't want unification either. They're like, oh, we'd have millions of, of far leftists joining a largely conservative South Korean culture. That's, that's problem one. Problem two, the human development there is so abysmal we're going to have to pump huge amounts of money into it to actually uh, make it, you know, first world like the rest of the Korean peninsula is. That's problem number, uh, number two. Problem number three, there's a sort of a fragile relationship between the South Koreans and the, and the Chinese, and they probably wouldn't like it very much if they had to share a border. So that's problem number three. But what's the alternative? China moves in, replaces one puppet with another, uh, makes it a mixed model sort of quasi-autonomous state or something, they're still sharing that border. They're still, over time, going to be doing business there and having to pump money into it, probably, because China's not going to be willing to do that alone. The South Koreans probably want access to some of those minerals. The mineral wealth alone, from a strictly fiscal standpoint, it makes no sense for the South Koreans not to want to reunify the peninsula just to gain access to the industrial wealth of North Korea. The wealth that you make from that offsets most of the cost that you have to pump into North Korea to build the roads, to build the rails, to improve uh, you know, housing quality, and so forth, to, to bring the technology there. And probably, honestly, in some cases, 
to de-brainwash the population, which has been told everything outside of North Korea is, is an abysmal hellhole. North Korea is actually really great. Look how clean and how gleaming and, and fresh everything is. You step over the border, everything beyond that is like terrible. And, and just uh, ignore ignore that skyline in the distance. It's a propaganda city. It's not like our propaganda cities or something like that. Uh, it would require a huge amount of work. But Trump ultimately here is throwing a curveball to the Chinese. He's getting them on board. This is his sense of diplomacy. You tell them, yeah, we might act on our own. You know, fuck off. If you're not going to do anything about this situation or work with us to do so, we will move in. We have the ability to do so. And he's actually right. The United States could lay waste to North Korea. They wouldn't be able to fight back. And not against us. They could attack South Korea, maybe Japan. We've got certainly, we've got THAAD systems there now. We've got all the Patriot uh, anti-missile systems. We certainly have naval and land assets in the region. We would flatline their air force. And that's the only way, by the way, they can deliver an atomic weapon. Most of their missiles probably wouldn't even you know, fire properly. Half the time they fire these off, they miss fire. It's like they, uh, they had that propaganda image of Kim Jong-un there. You remember after the next to last missile test they did. And it showed him actually like giving a piggyback ride to one of these other officers. People are like mystified. They're like, oh yeah, but it's, they're not actually happy there. This dude is like, he's being commanded to ride dear leaders back. And he knows if he doesn't, he's probably going to get shot and dug into a shallow grave or something. But you remember they were all celebrating. So they have this like new missile test and it's kind of a new missile design and they're all happy. The next one they fire, it misfires. It like fizzles off into the, into the coastline. So North Korea is not exactly the most uh, prowess-driven military power of Asia. In fact, they're the least among the military powers of Asia. The Philippines could easily kick their ass with a concerted effort. The problem is all the artillery, the tanks, the tunnels, and so forth. That is something the United States is capable of dealing with. But Trump's real goal is to get the Chinese involved for a joint invasion, probably. Yeah, you may, you may see uh, the uh, reunification of Korea in the next few years. It's possible. Uh, all you have to do is get China involved. When it becomes clear that China is planning to backstab them, as Kim Jong-un, I'm sure, would uh, proclaim it to be, they may very well decide to attack China. It'd be totally suicidal. What else are they going to do? If North Korea really thinks it's going to get invaded anyway, they will launch preemptive strikes. They will attempt to use atomic weapons if they have the ability to drop them, by the way. And when it's discovered, that the North Korean regime even thought about using atomic weapons seriously. Not for propaganda, not saying, oh, we're going to nuke our enemies, not saying, not flying a plane next to the DMZ with an atomic weapon on it, and then, you know, saying, haha, fuck you to, to the South Koreans. I mean, literally drawing up a contingency to deploy those weapons. When it gets out that that's happened, every other country in the region is going to march into North Korea. They won't last a week. That's as ultimately what would happen. And if you listen to the defectors, a large proportion of the younger North Koreans already know they live in a hellhole. They don't even really like Kim Jong-un. It's just they're too terrified to protest. They're too terrified to take up arms. They don't have any arms really to take up. A bamboo stick that's going to do really well against all those soldiers that they have there. Now, the U.S. could lay waste to them on our own with one arm tied behind our back. They don't have the ability to fight a, a war that doesn't involve just land maneuvers. Their air force wouldn't last a day. We would completely destroy them. We beat the shit out of Saddam Hussein's forces. Much more well-equipped, larger manpower, at least as far as regular forces. We did so very quickly with shock and awe. Now, if Saddam Hussein didn't see that coming, didn't realize what was going to happen, Kim Jong-un doesn't have a clue. I hate to say it, but that's true. I don't support the idea of a unilateral invasion into North Korea. But if I was going to support a unilateral invasion anywhere, that's probably where I would support it in. It's the one place where we could actually legitimately liberate a people who are suffering under abject and complete totalitarianism. It's one of the few truly totalitarian regimes that exist in the world today. It'd be like invading Turkmenistan, kicking that uh, idiot that runs their country out. The one that uh, printed up his own book and replaced the Quran with it, of all things, and has everyone totally up in arms. But again, they've got mineral wealth, so the Russians sort of uh, make sure everyone softballs them on their human rights record. 
It's pretty sad when the Chinese, with their human rights record, they're getting uncomfortable with one of their former vassals. When the Chinese tell you to cut it out on the human rights side, there's a problem. Yeah, that, that doesn't really generally happen. The only other place they could look to, to condemn some other country, maybe Burma or something like that. North Korea will probably fall in our lifetimes. And the US, you see it in the uh, corporate media. Some of the chicken hawks that, by the way, would love Trump if he invaded uh, North Korea, if for the wrong reasons, because they just want a good scoop on all the, the bloodletting and civilian casualties. Even they're now gearing up for war, saying, oh, well, the U.S. Uh, sit back and watch what happens, you know, just uh, wait it out and wait for North Korea to collapse strategy hasn't worked. Even they're gearing up for it. Now, I'm not going chicken hawk here. There would be civilian casualties, but I mean, Jesus Christ, there's uh, civilian casualties anyway now, aren't there? Tens or hundreds of thousands of people are probably starving to death in North Korea every year anyway. So what's the point of their regime continuing? Then you have all the other diplomatic scholars. You do have the constant uh, perturbation of South Korea, Japan, and the United States, and now China as well, because they let uh, sanctions go through by the North Korean government, saying basically, oh yeah, eventually we're going to wipe you off the face of the earth, ha ha ha. It's not actually going to happen, but they do keep making these threats. And if for a moment it looks like the threat might actually be serious, yeah, they're probably going to get bombed. We'll wait until North Korea fire, uh, throws the first stone, so to speak. It's entirely possible that they will be pushed into that if China gets involved. And that's probably uh, Donald Trump's plan. That's about all. Peace out.